So I think the thing that folks outside of development may not be familiar with is that you have this period pre-development before you've closed the loan where it's you're on a cash basis, it's your own money. And just for our viewers' background, once you have a fully formed deal with this is entitled and you got the pretty pictures and you got DDs and all those things, yeah, you can get investors and debt, but it's it can cost a small fortune or a large fortune to get to that fully formed deal part. So that's going to be our focus. So to launch, one of the first things that one has to do, I suppose, is get the site under contract or get it under control. What are the things, if any, that you do before you get the site under control? Are you a, let's get it under control because I like this parcel, and then then we'll start our due diligence? Or are you a, I'm going to be somewhat down the road by the time I put it under control? Well, I hope I won't give you the same answer too much, but it depends. Um, I would say that in some neighborhoods, if we have significant experience in the product type, the neighborhood, um, or we have, say, a customer in hand, if we're building an office building and we know that they need X number of square feet, right. we may be more aggressive and we want land control really quickly. Or like we are today, we're in a super competitive market. Good sites don't stay on the market long. That's right. You know, we, we're just you know, dancing at somebody else's wedding if we don't have site control. So we need to make sure that we get site control quickly and then we we put everything towards it. Typically, in a normal development cycle, I would come in and do back of the napkin, um, you know, maybe a small site plan internally uh, that we might try to sketch ourselves, or we right. would do it just based on metrics. If we've got X number of square feet uh, or X number of acreage, we were able in past years to get X number of square feet, and then we can start to uh, apply that into. Uh, what we know costs are today, and we can get a back of the napkin feel if the project is going to be good or not, or if it's going to be tight. The challenge with putting it under contract too early before you know all that is you may agree to a price that doesn't work. That's the whole work. That's the dilemma. And it's very hard. It's much easier to negotiate the right price before than to bring somebody back from the win of the lottery. You know, right. I have had that experience. So, uh, yeah. Um, do you, so that's, there's, there's somewhat of an art to that. Do you, do you chat with, you know, lawyers and, or do you go down to the city, um, generally speaking before you do site control? I mean, I know it depends, but my first conversations either really before the properties under contract in a normal market cycle are probably going to be with a, a landscape architect or an architect and, uh, to make sure that I, 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 I check and balance myself on my vetting. Did my back of the napkin envelope, is that real? Are, are all of those assumptions real? And there's some of that data that's in the market freely available, cost per square foot, for instance. And there's right. some that are very site-specific. And I usually want to gut check on that site-specific layout and design. If I'm looking at multifamily, if I think I can get X number of units, I, I need to make sure that I'm close to right. Right. And uh, that could be a phone conversation, you know, yep. that, yep. hey, you know, I One call hour my of favorite billing. architect. Yeah. And usually there's a lot of conversation that we'll have about when you pay certain costs. Um, I, I think it's somewhat of an industry norm. I'll probably get tomatoes thrown at me from the architects over this, but there's a little bit of a, a lost leader implied early on that they will do significant work up front to help me yep. get a real project knowing that they have a real opportunity to get a much bigger payday to, to actually design the project. Yeah. And I think that's common in GCs as well. When you do tie up a site, I'm sure this also depends, but do you have a standard initial due diligence first, second extension kind of window of time that you say, it doesn't really make sense for me to tie up this site 
for less than this amount of time? I, yes, we do. Uh, it's a frustration in the market that there's lots of norms that happen with the brokerage community that they're, they're not real norms in the development community. And it, it feels like a lot of bait and switch, which I really hate doing. But there's 90 and 120 day time cycles when going into a project, some of them are just more complicated than others. And you know that that is not a reasonable no. amount of time <laughs> to do the vetting. So we will often put in the contract that we send out that we'll put up an additional deposit or that we have the right to ask for an extension, et cetera, hoping that uh, the landowners understand. And we also try to have an all hands on deck meeting very early. I don't like to buy properties from any owner without being in a room with them and discussing the process. So some people may do it all through brokers. I'm uncomfortable with that. I, I like to stop and say, here's what I'm going to do when I go under contract and here's how it's going to work. And do you have any questions? Because often sellers don't understand the process. That's right. There's educational either. piece and, that goes on. Yeah, exactly. I, now I remember in a conversation that we had like a year or two ago, um, you've talked about early on in your career, uh, a lot of your deals you would get off market just for obvious reasons because market pressures haven't started pushing that price up. And I think you said something like, you know, for however many doors you knocked on, 50 would have the conversation and then 10% of those would actually go to close. But those are some of your sweetest deals. Has that changed? Has that gotten more difficult as you've scaled or is that still kind of modus operandi? It, it's interesting you're asking me that question. We had the internal conversation this morning that uh, we're in a hyper heated market right now. So the projects that we see that get listed and go out on the various real estate websites, uh, I just made the comment internally that 100 other developers, you know, 50 of them in my locality and another 50 that want to be in the locality are seeing it at the exact same time. And unless we know something different, there's a competitive disadvantage and somebody right. in that 100 is going to overpay because right. they don't know. And right. so we're better. I still like deals off market better. Um, not, it has really very little to do with the price. The land price is not the issue. It is, it is timing and relationship with the seller and the neighborhood that you can usually avoid some of the brokerage community driven melodrama if you create a relationship with the seller directly, or if, if you employ the broker who works exclusively for you, as long as they know that they're exclusive to the buyer, then they don't create a a false sense, but even, and that holds true, I think, on development property that you might be assembling, but even more so on uh, active projects now in the auction sites, you know, there's an expectation of a 30 or a 60 day close. And uh, it, it really is making it challenging for the small investor to, or small development company, anybody that's outside of a national franchise with 15 analysts sitting in their office. Uh, it's, it's challenging to run on that speed. Well, and to the back to the topic of pre-development risk, though, even if you can, let's say you can close in 30 or 60 days cash or something, you know, um, it, it turns into a land banking deal and you still really haven't gotten everything worked out quite like you want to. And suddenly you're land banking again, and that can be an existential threat if it, ha you know, if it becomes a... Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like musical chairs. When you're land banking, at some point, you know the music will stop and that land becomes much more expensive than what you paid for it. Um, but in some cases, a lot of the work that we do, urban sites, we have to assemble products. Right. And there's some, it, it frankly gives us an opportunity. There are places just like the speed of closing where the big firms have better opportunities, better options to, you know, do a 60 day close on a $10 million, $50 million deal, whatever, but they don't have the patience to buy one site and then wait for That's six right. months for somebody to find another office or whatever it may That's be. Right. So we look at it like a very patient game of chess in some neighborhoods. We just start buying pieces and we yep. wait and try to make sure we've got a good relationship. And if we don't pay too, too much, the worst case scenario is we can sell them to someone else at par value and, and back out of it. Right. But it, it can tie up a lot of money. The, Especially if, the real, if you're covering your debt service by the assets on, that's on the side and it's not the highest and best use, but at least it's, 
it's kind of covering itself or minimizing your losses as you assemble the rest of the parcel. Well, and usually if a lender knows that you're working on an assemblage, unless you've got credit tenants within those assemblage, you're dealing with all cash. Uh, lenders, they, you don't get a high loan to value or any loan in some cases to speculate. So um, you're tying up a lot of your own cash. Now, the alternate to that is working off of options, which I did earlier in our career, my career before uh, the, the companies all scaled up. But it, for a few thousand dollars, in some cases hundreds of thousands, you can tie up a million dollar piece of property. It's right. risk. But if you feel confident enough about the deal, you may not have to close. And, and I think this is more of a personal psychology observation than it is a real estate observation. But there's, there's the presumption that sellers need to sell quickly in the market and that you know, buyers are reluctant. And that's not always the case. Sometimes a seller has certain things going on that it could be an emotional tie to the property that a right. slow pace is much better or they have to find a place to move their office or their home That's to, right. or they've got inheritance to distribute, that sort of thing. So I, I, that's another reason I really like to get to know the other side of the table, not just through a broker. There's, sometimes there's things that we can do that we are the better buyer than a, you know, a, a national right. REIT. Well, and as you, as you get to know them, you know, I've, I've come across a number of times. If, if we're talking in you know, the Lower East Side of Manhattan, perhaps there's not the same emotion, but if there is a relationship that builds and something about the end product can foreshadow or in some way incorporate something of the history of this property, that can, that can be a big deal for some sellers, you know? And so that's, as you sure. say, not something you get with a 30-day hard money close. Exactly. Well, the other part of that too, and this is worth saying, I think, is that Again, where do we as a, we're, I call us a mid-sized development company, where do we bring value to the table? It is in producing those assemblages and those relationships. And so in a normalized market, we should be able to produce an assemblage below the, the value of an assembled track. There should be margin of course. in, yeah, that's where you're in that money. land price. So when I turn around and go to you know, behemoth development, REIT, they are willing to pay me a margin for the patients I've had for, in some cases, five or 10 years. Of course. Okay, so you've got the site under control. Um, and then, you know, we kind of get into these other issues. So um, as I look at, you know, the, uh, how I have it, and I, I, in some sense, I do this chronologically on mine, but then in others, in other senses, so market study, for example, obviously, you can do your own in-house market study, and you better do your own in-house market study quick and on the cheap. But uh, at what stage do you guys usually pull the trigger, you know, five grand on the official market study? Uh, as late as possible. Um, and this may be specific to our company. We feel um, very confident about our market knowledge. We only work in a few markets, North and South Carolina, major metros. It's not too difficult to get in and understand what's going on in the market. So the, It's mostly a lender thing. Yeah, this is nothing against appraisals or anything, but the, the government standards now of how appraisers are drawn, the kind of a blind pool, we often end up having to educate the appraiser. So right. the value that we get out of that actual product is very little to us. And that's because, you like, you know, we had, um, we're dealing with this right now, you know, different companies... Uh, bid this thing and maybe they're in a different market or they do a slightly different asset class, but they were the low bid and it's a blind thing and the bank's producing costs. So now you have this appraiser who appraises one asset class in one market looking at your deal in a different town, this slightly different asset class. And Absolutely. We, I'll give you a quick example of that. We were doing a $30 million apartment project that's a stick built walk up product where the surface lots around it. And we had an appraiser that showed up. And by the way, the banks aren't just savings costs. Part of it is regulatory pressure on the bank of course to yep yep don't, not to influence the appraiser that's right but the, the, the appraiser that actually showed up and and actually did the first appraisal uh had never done any more multifamily than a quadruplex and so you know we we scratched our heads and thought you know how in the world is he qualified to do it and without mentioning any names ultimately he wasn't we the bank and the borrower 
threw that appraisal out when we got it, but we still had to pay for it. So well, that's a feather in your hat because once an appraisal comes in, I mean, you can be in a in a in a rough way because you know alterations to that, like you say, there's regulatory pressure to keep that thing under a lid. So kudos to you for for doing that. But it's hard, and I I I kind of feel for bankers in that regard too because often they know the product very well. They've dealt that's with right. the borrower. You know, they, they've seen that we've vetted. They know that it's going to be a good deal, and they get stuck in that world as well. So, so um, two related issues that come up, survey and title. So, you know, you go to get your Alta, and they're basically making you a graphic title report, maybe with, with Topo, putting the utilities and so on. When do you guys get the survey crew involved? Uh Again, usually a little later in the process, if we, a uh, public record will allow us to pull deeds and we can cross-reference that with what the city has, and we would have something in our purchase contract that the uh, survey had to be consistent with what we thought right. we were buying. So okay. it's, it's usually somewhere fairly late in the process. Now, if we have a site that has a lot of topography or we have suspicion of subsurface rock, for instance, or anything like that, we may get into the survey quicker. Okay. Um, and but, so related question there in terms of rock and so on, when do you, some of these are very small items, you know, um, appraisal market study, but then as we get into kind of the bigger fish, um, I know you can spend a ton on geotech. Um, and that's also, I mean, that stuff under the dirt, you know, what am I going to hit there in terms of structural you know, what, what kind of earthwork is going to be required, reinforcing. When do you start looking at geotech, digging backhoe pits, um, you know, spending that, you know, 30, 40 grand or whatever it's going to cost to do that? Well, the geotech is more expensive than the backhoe pit. The backhoe pit, in my opinion, is more valuable. Um, <laughs> but it, it really depends on what we think the site's going to become. If we've got a site where we might have 20 feet of cut, the tobacco pit doesn't do you much good if you're dealing with a site of two or three feet. Where And this is just eyeballing. I, obviously, at this point, we're, we're dealing with county GIS for topo and things like that. Yep. Um, but I can tell you, when I was early in my career, I didn't give it enough sensitivity or credibility, and I would wait very late in the process to do it. And I have been burned a few times by finding a vein of rock that wasn't obvious and you know when you start blasting your cost get out of line very quickly right so it's it, it's important to do it uh it's just a gut call again as to when you might do it and it, some of it is obvious there are you know the old tree people would tell you depending on the type of tree they can tell you whether there's rock under the ground some trees grow over rock and some do not and um you know, okay, send me that V card. I need to get those guys in my Rolodex. Yeah, do you, do uh, you? Most of them are working on retirement now. But they, the rule used to be: when you see pine trees, you may be worried about rock. Do you put any stock in you know the geotech um, hack of pulling up a USGS report or something? I know those those get dated, you know, quickly. But I mean, is that a quick go to reference that you would because it's it's not a surrogate for actually pulling the cores or whatever, but it, 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 it's, it's more than just eyeballing the site while driving 45 miles an hour. I, I think there, it is more than that, and they're valid. It would, it would be in the second or third phase of our inspections that we would do that after that initial consultation with, say, the site planner, probably a landscape architect. My guess is that, and that's the pencil sketch, when they get to the next phase, they usually are pulling up historical GIS and, and you know, any data, the sites that have been developed around the site we're looking at, for instance, and they're looking at those potential subsurface issues because they will often come back to me and say, we better do our drilling sooner than later because there may be rock. So let's or talk there may be soft soils. Right, right. So let's talk about design, which is really the the elephant in the room with all of this, because you're, you're, and this is, I think something that's not appreciated on the municipal side of things, the amount of cost that one incurs getting these drawings to a level that you can give them to the building inspector to then have them, you know, waved out, you know, thrown out. You have no idea what that just cost me. So let's talk about that because in my own, you know, sure. you know, my own work, you know, I've, uh, 
I've taken an interest in Revit and SketchUp and GIS and all these things for that very initial equivalent of a back of the back of the napkin. You know, I can do a quick massing and put it on Google Maps or something. But what? So you, I know you said one of the first people you chat with is landscape or an architect. For folks who don't have the background in this, maybe chat with us about um, the developer's experience with um, design costs and when they hit. So I've talked in previous episodes about SD, DD, and CD and the different levels of resolution. But I know that you get SD to kind of get the conversation going, but the trick with DD is that's kind of where between DD and CD, that's where a lot of your work is. Um, but it comes, it can also come very late in the process. And I know some people try to float those costs till after closing, Hey, draw it for me right now. And then once I close, I'll pay you, which requires a lot of trust. Could you talk about the timing and also the billing of your development costs and in your experience, I'm sorry, design Your, costs. Uh, it's, it's a great question and it, it may be broader than you realize it's very product uh, sensitive. So mm -hmm. for a single family neighborhood, the design requirements for the actual lots, for instance, are pretty normalized. However, different municipalities may look at the housing requirements differently, where the face of the garage is, what the finished set yep. is, and there's the some CCR municipalities stuff. that... There's, there's a lot of municipalities who... Um, I, this is a kind of an old guy talking, but I think they use it as a systematic discrimination in some ways that they can run the cost of housing up in their municipalities right. uh, by forcing certain design standards. But if you move to... An office building, you know, there's only so many ways you're going to do a square box, and it's pretty not that hard. You move to a multifamily product, and there is often a lot of scrutiny of how the design happens. Certain right. municipalities that we work in, for just for simple site plan approval, they ask you to go through a, an illustrative design of the elevations and things like that. And usually that's much later in the process and not related yep. to the site plan. And so it can cost a lot of money up front if you got into an urban mixed use or urban multifamily site. Uh, you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars with the architect to, to try to get to that approval. And if you don't get the approval, you're probably not going to close on the land and it's wasted money. So it's, it, that's a, a lot of people play games with what those early requirements are for, um, for the elevations and sensitivities related to that. And it's also becomes very political if you end up um, in a rezoning. One of my mentors said that uh, the art of going through a rezoning is taking outright extortion and turning it into benign confiscation. And there's a lot of truth to that. So you get a lot of people in a rezoning who have political power, but they have no industry knowledge. And they say, well, of show course. me exactly what this side of the building is going to look like on this street because I have a friend that lives there, or that's the side of the building that I'll see. And that could be a, one comment that could be tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to show. And so you have to talk them back off of that edge. There's a, I, did I, do you feel like I answered Yeah, no, it does. Well, there's a, there's a cheap and dangerous um, way that some people get a, try to get around that. You know, with An architect will very often come to a developer and do a visual preference survey and say, hey, here's a bunch of pictures. Tell me what you like, you know, if it's somebody you haven't worked with. So uh, it's very dangerous, I would say, to involve any public body, uh, certainly people who don't have an industry background or a financial stake in what the building's going to look like. But would you ever, and this is not a Socratic question, would you ever say, folks, I don't want to go down the $250,000 road of telling you exactly what this is going to look like because I'm early in the game. Here's a mood board with six images. Imagine the intersection of these things. It costs me nothing to do this, but you understand if you triangulate these six images, I can tell you how tall it's going to be because that's going to be early on. We're going to have to discuss that. And it's going to be in essentially this style. Are you interested? Do you want me to spend... Three hundred thousand dollars. You know, like it's dangerous because you're giving them now some control in the process. On the other hand, you are, if it works, precipitously lowering that pre-development risk that we're talking about. 
Well, I, I would say we, we do both. There are some municipalities that absolutely force you to do a site-specific design. Um, Durham, North Carolina does that to us. We have to give them elevations. And it can't be a what I would call a storyboard. Right. Um, but there are others, when you're going through a rezoning process, often that is the best. The picture's worth a thousand words, and that's the well, best way to go. It's a, it's a very slippery slope, though, because the more detail you give, drawing it and now you building can't change it, it are very often different. Yeah, they, they, they had in their mind that the color of brick that was black and white on the paper was going to be different than the brick you chose. And then municipalities or council people feel like you've misled them. And it's, right. it's just perception usually. But um, I would think a lot of your questions related to a startup developer, if you will. I would think that is a very dangerous territory to be in alone right. um, on your first time. That's where, they, and so let's get back to the overall topic of due diligence and when you spend what on pre-development. That's where it becomes very valuable to hire an expert who's been through the process. It's either uh, your engineer, your architect, you know, an attorney who's going through the zoning, that kind of thing. That the experience they have of what you absolutely have to do and what you may be able to negotiate your way around can in be In terms worth. of entitlement requirements. In terms of entitlement requirements. So it's rare that we would have a banker, for instance, if we're thinking about the deal going through a process and we get land control and we go to our equity or debt lenders, it's pretty rare that they want to talk about elevations and renderings and things like that. If you happen to have them, they, they look at it and they say, great, that's a nice pretty picture. And, but it's not a requirement at that level. Um, sometimes it becomes a requirement of the land seller, which is a shocking thing, but it shows you the emotional attachment that people will have to an area. I've lived here all my life. I don't want to sell the property to something that's not going to look good for my neighbors. Mm -hmm. It's a close. And so you have to go through a process for them. I've heard some lawyers say the and actually one of the uh, chief I think it's the chief urban planner here in Madison with whom I've had chats. She said, "If the zoning is in your favor, which often it's not, but if the zoning uh, happens to be in your favor, if you show the three dimensional box of air massing, like this is what the code says I can build." Now you've moved the conversation from this emotional thing about what people want, and I you know. Her, to her credit, to, to put it that way, and we're talking about this is what, in theory, the law allows. That brings up another question. Um, isn't that, that uh, isn't don't don't uh, litigators use that same thing? If the law is on your side, pound the argue facts. the law. If if the uh, if the law is against you, pound the emotion. Right, right. <laughs> I, I've heard it. If the law is on your side, argue the law. If the facts are on your side, argue the facts. If neither are on your side, just argue. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, just pound. Right, right. Well, th so this brings up um, another question, which has just escaped me while I was trying to formulate that joke. Um, Sorry. Um, no, that's all right. I'm sure it'll come back to me. Um, oh, I know what it is. So as I'm doing all this back of the envelope stuff, trying to make the deal seem more fully formed than it actually is in some sense. Like, I haven't hired the architect, but here's a massing. I haven't hired the geotech, but here's a USGS report. You know, you're, you're trying to make it seem more formed perhaps than it is in a formal sense. One of the biggest dilemmas that I'm encountering is that there is no legal instrument or process by which I can even confirm what the by right zoning is. I can take the zoning code to the help desk and say, you know, as I read this, the setbacks are going to be 20 feet on the left side because there's a residential. And then over here, there's going to be this. Is that right? And they're like, yeah, I think so. But that's all I can get. You know, and if I want to go to the architect and say, hey, don't worry, I already did all the, you know, I know, I know what this site can handle. No worries. Yeah, I can't do it. And it makes me ask the question, well, then what are they doing before they do, do all these drawings and we go for our first you know, uh, you know, general approval. What are they doing? Like, how do I determine? And and I've just been told that because of neighborhood association me association meetings that have quasi political, uh, you know, ramifications and the number of different factors that nobody at the city 
will even tell you what the buy right zoning allows until you have a concrete yeah. proposal, which is just so cost, cost inefficient. But I mean, has that been your experience? And it just makes me wonder, what's the architect doing that's giving them the confidence that they know what I can do here? Uh I think it, uh, it often depends on the municipality, but that pressure on municipal employees is, is rampant everywhere. And I think politicians drive it, uh, probably well-meaning you know, neighbors and landowners drive it, that they, they accuse or second-guess municipal figures of approving things that they shouldn't. Right. Um, no one you know, wants that signature. Against... Well, and you've got to think about it. If you're a municipal worker, a lot of times the only decision you can make is a bad one. No decision is not bad. Right. So um, that's where, and I think it ends up driving our uh, municipalities crazy because you end up having, especially if it's an important project, you're going to have to rise up to the level of the planning director to get a firm answer on certain things in a lot of occasions. And that's a shame. And even in some municipalities that we deal with, the planning director is reluctant to give you that because they know they'll have to answer to city manager, mayor, you know, it's a, uh, it, there's a lot of political power that floats into zoning code. Unfortunately, There's only downside, no upside in their situation is really kind of what it boils down to. It's just such a, it's such an inverse yeah. to the development equation. You know, it's, and it's all negotiated. If you can, it's pretty hard to argue, you know, uh, Socratic method. If you can prove that two other projects that are similar have had similar setbacks or parking ratios or whatever the argument may be, then you've given that municipal worker cover to say, then yes, you can do the same thing that's already been allowed. And it, I think it takes a lot of creativity out of the business. You, every city ends up with some homogenous product. And I think this is part of how that happens. But Perfect segue to talk about municipal done. costs. Cause that's another major cost that I, you know, deal with also in a pre-development sense. So in some cases, the you have this interplay between the bank and the city. So uh, if the bank would give me the loan, I could use the proceeds to pay the municipal fees. Uh, but maybe the bank wants my building permit in hand. So now I'm in this position where I got cash, and it may be, I, you know, I, I the fees, and I'll, I'll post some, you know, I'm looking right now at a $40,000 library fee for something I'm working on. So the fees just are breathtaking sometimes. Is it been your experience that it's usually a cash item that you pay before closing, or how often are you able to float those costs and pay them with loan proceeds? Uh, in my experience, you get, uh, this is unfortunate for startup developers, and, and of course I faced it myself, but um, trust with verification that if if you have done a few projects you can usually float those fees within the loan if you're on your first few projects the bank may want you to prove that you're actually going to get your permits and right. then they'll reimburse you um so and, and well, that's in some a cases you, you, yeah in some cases you pay that fee and it becomes you do get credit for it as your percentage of equity in the project it's a yep. real deal cost there's a couple other fees, you know, uh, do you usually pay when you get working with lenders, do you usually pay a commitment fee to lock in, in some sense, the loan? We have, and I'm, I've been burned a few times too. It's, uh, I think it's becoming industry norm in a lot of places. I, I rarely will pay them here. I, there's, there's so many lenders out there now, and this is the other part of, you know, know who you are, know where you are in the world. There's a lot of lenders out there now. And if my typical publicly traded banks are not going to ask me for a commitment fee prior to giving me a commitment, right? Um, or at least a letter of intent, the fly-by-night lenders, some of them unfortunately make their money off of people paying them commitment fees early, and then they can't deliver on the proceeds. So I don't do it. The simple answer. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's usually an inconvenient expense, you know, at the time that it comes. Um, and then in operations, obviously you've got, you know, legal, accounting, marketing. How much float do you usually see, for example, with legal costs? Um, 
what percent if 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 you took this project that you're looking at, you know, which you're just showing me the budget on, what percentage of your legal costs would you say are probably incurred and paid before your loan closing and what percent after if you just had to shoot from the hip it? Um, legal is a hard one that we do. I'm fortunate we have enough volume of business in our entire portfolio that I can usually call and ask a few simple questions about a promotional project and maybe I don't get billed at all or it's at a okay. minimal rate. Um, but if, if I were a startup developer, I would expect to probably incur their hourly rate. They may give you terms, but I think you should expect to pay the entire amount. The, the legal bills for most projects aren't so big that they're going to donate the entire thing to the cause. They may give you a reduced hourly rate up front, um, but where an architect, a landscape architect may give you a fairly free sketch, you know, in the hundreds of dollars when their time's really worth thousands in the the hopes that that promotional effort actually gets your project launched and then they get a you know tens of thousands right contract from you i'm gonna keep us on track here we just got a few more minutes but um one wrap-up question sure. on this piece and it doesn't really relate to cost because there's probably not going to be a cost but it certainly relates to one's reputation and ability to work well with gcs and subs and so on you know, there's this triangle between you have the market research, you have your financial model. It's not a triangle. I suppose it's a box. Market research, financial model, design, and cost. And you keep running this iteration, you know, what's the cost of my drawings and what, you know, and, and, and so on. I mean, you can, market research, you can pretty much nail that and you get your financial model at the ready, but design, cost, design, cost, and there's the whole design build thing. But nonetheless, my... One of my big questions and kind of fears has been you got some drawings and you're like, okay, I'm going to go bid these. Uh, maybe on the goodwill of a GC or something, they'll spend three or four hours and maybe you even pay them for their time. Give me a plus or minus 10% bid on this. Okay, it's too high. So we're going to redraw this a bit. Hey, can you rebid that? And then you're in your like third and fourth rebid and people are like, forget it. I, I can't rebid Ben's, you know, fourth thing and so there's this dilemma like you need to bid it to know what it's going to cost but you can't really rebid it many times because people are going to say you know Lindsay can't pull the trigger Ben doesn't know what he wants this kind of a dilemma it's not a cost thing but it's very much a pre-development problem of dialing in what your costs are going to be any Absolutely. words of wisdom for that uh, well, I, I would say your box is really a star, and the other point on that star is the outside market. You know, um, last year, I'll just give you a quick analogy. We were working on an office project, which we're about to launch now, and the current office rates last year, the project did not work. And so in the, in the year forward, the office rates have climbed so fast that the revenue. we have now a, a very valuable project. Yeah, so the market is telling us, We'll pay for what it'll cost to build it. But in the meantime, we have we bid it last year as if we were getting ready to start. And then we did a check with the market and the market said, no, we can't afford that. And so all of those bids that we got have gone stale and the cost of steel has gone up, for instance, things like that. So it's, it, I draw it as a star that, that the point of the star is bouncing in the middle of that all the time. And uh, it's... It's a push and pull. I would say most of the contractors in the industry know that that's what's going on. If they're busy enough, they might not even participate with you. Um, the great part about, this is one of the beautiful things about technology, is getting current cost information is much more accessible now than it used to be. Um, but I look at most of our projects like like a work of art or a recipe rather than something chiseled in stone is that they are always changing all the time and you can build the exact same building twice and it won't turn out the same way twice. It's just the nature of the business. So um, the other part I would, if the advice I would give to any younger developers, anybody young in the business is track cost of things that you've done in the past. If your friends will tell you what they right. paid for sticks and bricks, you know, use those costs just be a hog for information. And then when you're running your performance, you'll become much more accurate of what the real cost is. 
be very leery of rules of thumb. Right. Well, I know that's a major difference in getting kind of modeling in the academy versus modeling, you know, in the field. Once you have that historical data, you're, you're at, you know, off to the races pretty quick. Well, let me just wrap up with a few questions. And as you say, that's the nature of the business. A lot of people, um, for that reason, don't want to get into the business or can't or whatever. Uh, because of these pre-development yeah, sure. expenses that you deal with in the multi-year process, spending cash at risk. So many people write off development, but other people say, hey, I'm going to do acquisitions, learn the business, and then I'll do development as if you know, there's a straight line. And I've never quite understood that logic because they're, they're very different, which is not to say that acquisitions is any less difficult because you have so many constraints and it's just how do I, how do I bid the most and not regret it later? So they, they're both complicated. But nonetheless, um, you don't seem to have taken that path. Oh, I'm going to acquire a bunch of stuff until I develop. And I don't know your, your history you know, with any kind of ultra high precision, but what led you then to make that decision? I'm not going to acquire until I develop. I'm going to develop. Well, there, I think the perception of development being expensive may be, may be a little bit false. If, if I go out and buy a building, um, you know, there's a lot of, money that is in that building to go out and plan and design the building and early on certainly partner with someone else to get it built my my cost of entry was fairly low i completely would agree with you that there they are two distinctly different paths and i have met experts who over decades careers have bought as existing properties who are absolutely lost when they enter my world of developing from the ground up and I have to say, we have made an effort to acquire existing properties and we get lost in certain facets. How, how's the management happening? Where are the margins here? And then there's, uh, there's the tolerance of risk versus reward, right? So the, the reward on a traded property, all the creative parts are gone. Typically, unless you're working on a value add, you know, the design of the product has been done, the rents are established, you're working off of a margin rate. It's, it's a traded product. It's normalized. Where in development, you're starting with a blank slate. So you, certainly there are more risks to get a development deal done, but your margins are significantly better because it's not yet normalized. And so that, that's what probably attracted us to the development on the front end. And uh, also, I think it's really key for anybody young in the business to know what they bring to the table. There's, there's knowledge, but everybody's got that. There's money, but a lot of people have money. There right. are, there's deal control, and you're the only one with control of your deal. Right. Um, so access is a pretty big thing, and there's creativity. And not well, two people are created equal there. Well, so, and that's the next question. Like, um, if one is getting into development, which is extraordinarily capital intensive, one can either work in some other industry and save up that extraordinary capital, which can take an extraordinarily long time. Um, or one can say, I'm going to get site control and a tenant and then JV the pre-development. Like, you know, I got this thing. I got this thing. It looks like a fully formed deal. It's not, but it looks like it. Let's go this route together. I mean, is, would you advocate one or the other of those? Or is it just totally... Uh, person specific would, for for me personally it's uh, the risk for being a developer and creating was worth i jv'd my first deals we still jv a lot of deals because it's kind of lonely at the top and if you're planning a party and you're the only one that comes then it's pretty lonely you want the, you want to create something that's viable where other people will show up and so as you formulate your deal for a development deal, you can bring in partners, you can bring in bankers, et cetera. They bring knowledge and they share the risk with you. So for me, the, the margins are better. So there's more to go around for everybody being there. And if I decided I wanted to build a, a big box warehouse, which I've never done, I would absolutely go out and find someone who's done that and JV with them um, because the, the years of knowledge they bring you know, are, are indispensable where on the other side, go it alone. You may be able to keep all the profit, but you're making as, as smart as any one developer may be, you're making a lot of assumptions and putting a lot of 
credibility on your knowledge, not only of the sticks and bricks cost and the metrics to run a spreadsheet, but also the political environments and things like that. It's, it's lonely at the top. I'm, I'm a big advocate of joint venturing. If I'm assuming that we're kind of speaking to someone who's entrepreneurial minded in this case, some people think that they are that person and they get in and they realize the risk tolerance is uncomfortable. And there's lots of big development companies that need smart people on staff. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to go too, where you get collective knowledge. So, um, looking back on the things that we've discussed, all the things that are involved in the process, when do you advocate getting a joint venture partner? Because there's all these different stages we've talked about. I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do this. Obviously, I assume it's after site control, but otherwise, when is the advantageous point to bring them in so they still have influence, but late enough that, as you said, you have the deal, you control that deal in a unique way? Well, I would simplify it. To maximize the entrepreneur's value, um, you, you want to keep your options open as to who that joint venture partner is as long as you can. But there's going to become a risk tolerance, a discomfort of you spending all the money and planning it by yourself in isolation. And maybe you're planning something that ultimately you can't afford to fund all the way or it, it ultimately won't work with the market metrics. So what, what we do when we think we're going to joint venture with somebody is we will get land control, absolutely. We'll get into some limited design, run some back of the envelope performance. Um, you know, make sure that we've got what we think is a real deal, and then we'll go test our would-be partners. Is this the kind of deal that you would like? Um, I, I see it happen a lot that entrepreneurs create a great vision and they get started, and uh, unfortunately there are people that will kind of take your legs out from under you in those deals, so you want that control to be true and extendable. <laughs> Speaking don't, of that, do you do you usually make the joint venture you split the class A share in a certain way or is it a waterfall within a waterfall? Like how do you legally that's a whole episode into itself, I know, joint venture structure. That's a whole but, episode. Yeah, there's so many different ways. We'll to have do to do that, that some um, other time. And it it really I think to me, it depends who your target partner would be and understanding their motivations. We're doing a joint venture project now with a company that is a construction company at heart. So it's uh-huh. it's worth assuming they're going to want to build the product. Yep. And you know if I know that, then we're talking a lot more about um, GC fees and management fees of the process yep. itself rather than waterfalls on the back end. It, yep. Every one of them are different. Sometimes projects come to us through financial companies, and then we're talking about their pref rate a lot more than we are the That's back right. end. So everybody's going to get paid in a different so, way depending on their yeah. So last yeah, and, question and for you, Lindsay. as an entrepreneur, Lindsay, um, it's, really important. It's, it's really important to know where you're getting paid. And I know that sounds a little uh, flippant, but, but I, I see this a lot in uh, the young people that come to work for my company is the, the sex appeal of getting a project done eclipses the value you're actually walking away with. And sometimes the best projects are just the ugliest real estate. <laughs> Oh. So, um, cause you have some very pretty pictures in that room. I was, I saw when Jay and yeah. I were uh, looking at the room yesterday, some pretty pictures. Um, last question for you, Lindsay, I have found it in myself and in many other entrepreneurially minded people, a psychological impulse or urge when things aren't moving along as quickly as one had hoped to spend money on something, maybe something justifiable, maybe not, but to spend some money as a surrogate for the, pros- for the progress one had hoped to have seen. I was talking with somebody last week about, hey, could you code this thing for me? And it, it would be a macro that would blah, blah, blah. And, you know, oh, and I need to get that, you know, that Revit license update. And, you know, then I could really do whatever. And it's not really pertinent to a specific project. It's just, I should probably spend that money. Then I, then I can tell people, yeah, yeah, I just upgraded my Revit license. Do you um, experience that impulse? And if so, how do you rein that in 
because especially at your level, for me, it's a Revit license. For you, it's it's you know a, a probably a large ticket item. How does one rein that in? And because you got to spend some money at risk, but my tendency is just to spend it at waste almost, you know, so that I can feel like, hey, we're moving, we're moving. Any, any, well, it, that, that may be personality type. And I, I compliment you on that. You know, to be a developer, you have to be a little bit of an architect, a little bit of a lawyer, a little bit of a designer, a little bit of a decorator in a way. And so having all of those impulses to go and do probably means you just have a lot of neurons fi firing all the time, which is an awesome thing. But I, the suggestion I would make to any uh, young entrepreneur is you can, you can spend yourself in a hole and money won't buy you happiness. It won't buy you success. Right. And so there's, there's 10,000 things to do on any project. And you can find some of those that you can execute yourself, but you only have so much dry powder. Every developer only has so much dry powder. So, you know, go back to the American Revolution and only fire when you see the whites of their eyes. So um you know be be careful about spending because as you mentioned now as you're I'll requote you you've got a $40,000 municipal item hanging out there somewhere you may wish you hadn't bought that revit license when you have to write that check you know so right. it's uh you you have to be careful of where you spend that dry powder particularly prior to it being a vetted agreed closed deal and to me closing means closing a bank loan it does not mean buying property it means something that is actually progressive buying right. property can be regressive so right. it's for whatever Lindsay, this worth, has been that's the way fantastic I look at it. it's been fantastically helpful for me and i know it will be for a lot of the folks who are going to watch it so 